The still unexplained phenomenon of the jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder, the jumping Frenchman of Maine might sound like the latest indie band hoping to make it big on the music scene, but it's actually the name of one of the most bizarre medical phenomena ever uncovered in the modern era. Jumping Frenchman of Maine syndrome, first identified by George Millerbeard in 1880 is still incredibly mysterious and is still confounding to the medical community. In short, the jumping Frenchman of Maine disease, if it can even be called as such, is a startle disorder, and specifically a startle matching syndrome. Such afflictions cause one's startle reflex to be heightened to shocking proportions, which leads to exaggerated responses to unexpected stimuli. In the case of the jumping Frenchman, these responses could include leaping into fires, hurling knives, or even striking one's own best friend. The jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder was first described by George Millerbeard in 1878. The phenomenon that would come to be known as the jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder was first described by George Millerbeard in 1878 after he observed it near Moosehead Lake in Maine. Beard, a progressive neurologist whose advocacy for the mentally ill was decades ahead of its time, traveled to the region after hearing reports of strange behavior among the local population of French-Canadian lumberjacks and he found exactly what he was looking for. Those afflicted with the disorder, whom Beard referred to simply as jumpers, displayed a host of symptoms, and Beard soon realized they were dealing with an entirely unique medical phenomenon. Beard proposed several theories regarding the disorder's origins, as did several other researchers in the years thereafter, but the jumping Frenchman of Maine remained largely a mystery, and one that's unlikely to be solved anytime soon. The syndrome causes a greatly exaggerated startle reflex, in medical terms. Jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder is a startle matching syndrome, which means that it promotes an extremely exaggerated startle reaction in those afflicted. All humans have a startle reaction. It's what makes us react involuntarily to sudden and unexpected stimuli, but startle matching syndromes can heighten those responses to ridiculous proportions. That's where the term jumpers originated. Those suffering from the disorder could be observed screaming, flailing, or jumping out of their skin at the slightest stimulus. As long as the inciting sound or action was unexpected, those afflicted with the disorder were at the mercy of their involuntary reactions, which were often seen as comical in their extremity. One could only imagine how difficult such an affliction would be for a would-be lumberjack. The jumping Frenchman of Maine also experienced echolalia and echopraxia. The exaggerated startle reactions of the jumping Frenchman of Maine didn't always present themselves in the form of jumping or screaming, which, to an extent, are normal responses to unexpected stimuli. Sufferers of the disorder also experienced both echolalia and echopraxia, the involuntary repetition of words and actions, respectively. The echolalia led many to compare the jumping Frenchman to parrots, as some could be compelled to repeat anything that was shouted at them unexpectedly, even if they didn't understand the sentence's meaning. George Millerbeard described an incident in which he spoke Latin to a lumberjack who didn't comprehend the language. He repeated or echoed the sound of the word as it came to him, in a quick sharp voice, at the same time he jumped, or struck, or threw or raised his shoulders, or made some other, aggressive muscular motion. They could not help repeating the word or sound that came from the person that ordered them. The disorder also led to extreme suggestibility. By far the most eye-catching symptom of the disorder was an intense degree of suggestibility among the afflicted, so much so they would do practically anything that was suddenly shouted at them. Jumping Frenchmen could be convinced to hurl whatever was in their hands, jump into rivers, or even strike another person. They could, and were, by those less than sympathetic of their plight, be compelled to harm themselves or their loved ones. Oftentimes, these coerced reactions came with a hint of echolalia. As George Millerbeard describes, one of the jumpers while sitting in his chair with a knife in his hand was told to throw it, and he threw it quickly, so that it stuck in a beam opposite. At the same time he repeated the order to throw it. Ticklishness and shyness were the least dramatic symptoms. Two of the more mundane symptoms of the disorder were an increased level of ticklishness and shyness among the afflicted, but even those symptoms hinted toward some of the darker realities of life as a jumping Frenchman of Maine. Mistreatment of the jumpers was common, especially by English-speaking lumberjacks who were easily entertained by this manipulation. This culture of teasing may have actually had an impact on the proliferation of the disorder, as some researchers have observed a noticeable increase in the severity of responses in those who were more frequently startled. In other words, deliberately making a Frenchman of Maine jump would only worsen their affliction, but that didn't seem to dissuade those who delighted in tormenting them. The phenomenon was highly localized and mostly limited to French-Canadian lumberjacks, 
As its name suggests, the jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder was highly localized. George Millerbeard only observed it in the Moosehead Lake region of Maine, and only among those lumberjacks who were of French-Canadian descent, a small portion of the overall population in that area. The phenomenon occurred almost exclusively in lumber camps. Those afflicted, who were almost always men, typically began showing symptoms at a young age and these would continue indefinitely. The disorder did not appear to be contagious, since it didn't spread to other nearby logging communities, but instead contained entirely within a specific cultural niche. Dozens of individuals were afflicted. George Millerbeard observed at least 50 cases of the jumping Frenchman of Maine in the Moosehead region, and the actual number is assumed to be much greater. Strangely, 14 of the cases he studied were isolated in just four French-Canadian families, which led Beard to consider a genetic component to the phenomenon. Despite the prevalence of the disorder, French Canadians made up a small portion of the main population at the time, and jumping Frenchmen even less. This only added to the sense of cultural and societal isolation that some have claimed as the root cause of their inexplicable behavior. Contemporary descriptions of the illness are both humorous and horrifying. Any contemporary description of the jumping Frenchman of Maine in action is simultaneously humorous and horrifying. In 1880, George Millerbeard recounted that, two jumpers standing near each other were told to strike, and they struck each other very forcibly. When the commands are uttered in a quick loud voice the jumper repeats the order. When told to strike, he strikes, when told to throw it, he throws it, whatever he has in his hands. They could not help repeating the word or sound that came from the person that ordered them any more than they could help striking, dropping, throwing, jumping, or starting. All of these phenomena were indeed but parts of the general condition known as jumping. It was not necessary that the sound should come from a human being, any sudden or unexpected noise, as the explosion of a gun or pistol, the falling of a window, or the slamming of a door, provided it be unexpected and loud enough, would cause these jumpers to exhibit some one or all of these phenomena. It was dangerous to startle them in any way when they had an axe or knife in the hand. All of the jumpers agree that it tired them to be jumped and they dreaded it, but they were constantly annoyed by their companions. The non-afflicted would frequently mistreat the jumpers. Robert Pike, who spent time in Maine lumber camps and chronicled his experiences, described how frequently the non-afflicted would take advantage of the jumping Frenchman's sensitivities, if a jumper was shaving, or whistling, or just sitting on a river bank, and someone came up behind him suddenly and cried, jump into the river, or into the fire, if there was a fire, in he'd jump. If someone stepped up behind him and tickled him lightly, he'd jump through the roof. Strangely, the targets of such mean practical jokes never got mad about them. The men would wait until a cook was about to place a dish of soup or some other spilly food on the table and then say, drop it, and down it would come right down the neck of the nearest man. Beard thought the disorder had a genetic component, while others blamed interfamilial breeding, because the jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder was contained entirely to a specific populace, and because so many cases came from the same families, George Miller Beard suspected the disorder may have a genetic component. Modern researchers who subscribe to this line of thinking chalk it up to a somatic neurological disorder. Beard did not reach any hard conclusions, however, leaving the door open for other interpretations. Robert Pike, meanwhile, wrote that non-French locals believed the phenomenon was a result of interfamilial breeding, reasoning that French Canadians in Maine rarely married outside of their tiny communities. Subsequent research, however, has brought any hereditary link into question. Georges Gillis de Lato Red compared the disorder to the syndrome bearing his name, in 1885. French physician Gilles de Lato Red took great interest in the phenomenon of the jumping Frenchman of Maine. Having recently identified a similar disorder that now bears his name, Tourette syndrome, he concluded that the phenomenon in Maine was essentially the same, though later researchers disputed this claim. The major difference between the jumping Frenchman of Maine and those afflicted with Tourette syndrome is the requirement of unexpected stimuli. The tics associated with Tourette syndrome often occur entirely unprompted and without control, a stark contrast to the on-demand nature of the jumping Frenchman. Others believed the disorder was entirely psychological and probably a culture-bound syndrome. Most modern research into the jumping Frenchman of Maine contradicts the neurological theory Theories of George Millerbeard and Gillis de Lato Red, instead claiming the disorder is entirely psychological and tied heavily to the location in which it first occurred. Many have asserted the jumping Frenchman of Maine is a culture-bound syndrome, meaning it is caused by and contained to the local culture entirely. These theories purport the phenomenon is an example of culturally specific operant 
conditioning, wherein those afflicted have been conditioned by their local community to give a certain response, even a ridiculously exaggerated one, to a certain stimulus. What exactly causes this conditioning, however, is still not understood. Ultimately, no one really knows what causes the disorder, but some people are still afflicted. Ultimately, there's no easy answer as to what causes the jumping Frenchman of Maine disorder. Most modern theories adhere to the culture-bound syndrome explanation rather than the genetic neurological explanation, but such a conclusion is not without issues. George Miller Beard's observations demonstrated that jumpers' exaggerated reactions were completely involuntary, meaning if they were being conditioned to react to unexpected stimuli in such a way, the process was occurring on a subconscious level. Beard's observations, at the very least, rule out a case of mass hysteria. Any attempts to treat the disorder have been unsuccessful, in large part because it is still so misunderstood. The number of cases has greatly decreased since the turn of the 20th century, making any significant further study, which most agree would be necessary to reaching any definitive conclusions, next to impossible. That being said, eight jumpers were identified in Quebec for the purposes of a 1986 study on the subject, and each of them was French-Canadian and living in a lumber camp. This shows the jumping Frenchmen of Maine have persisted into the modern era, and that the scientific community still doesn't understand what makes them tick. There are other versions of the jumping Frenchmen of Maine elsewhere in the world. The jumping Frenchmen of Maine is a heavily localized phenomenon, existing only within lumber camps in Maine and Quebec, though there have been other instances of similar startle matching syndromes all over the world. Malaysia, it is known as Lata, and in Siberia it is called Myriokit. Other versions have appeared in India, Somalia, Yemen, and the Philippines. In each case, the disorder only shows up in culturally isolated communities. Perhaps the most similar phenomenon comes from certain isolated French populations in Louisiana, where the afflicted are referred to as Rajun Cajuns. Aside from the isolation, and in this case, the French-Canadian origins, there have been few links found between the various communities experiencing startle matching syndromes. The best origin theory revolves around boredom and the childhood game, perhaps the best theory relating to the phenomenon of the jumping Frenchman of Maine is also one of the simplest, the disorder largely stems from boredom. In 1965, Canadian neurologist Ruben Rabinovich, who had grown up around jumpers in Quebec, recounted the existence of a horse-kicking game in which children would attempt to provoke a reaction out of their elders by startling them. Rabinovich posited the isolation and tedium of lumber camps motivated lumberjacks to give an exaggerated response to such attempts to startle them, and their overreactions were all in good fun, at first. Over time, however, these extreme reactions may have turned into conditioned reflexes that certain members of the local populace had no control over, meaning the entire jumping Frenchman of Maine saga may have been the result of a child childhood prank taken too far.